Hey folks, what is up? It is Jack aka Mr Wolfie back with another shitey guide here on YouTube. This time it is for Jurassic World Evolution. The game's been out for about a week or two now but I feel that this has actually given me enough time to learn some of the core ins and outs of the game and thus be able to make a couple of guides on it. I have made two videos for J World now. The first one, i.e. the one that you're watching right now, is a more basic list of 15 starter tips. This is going to be more focused towards players who have less than 5 hours into the game or you know maybe for people who haven't played it at all and are looking to pick up at some point maybe in a sale or whatever and they're looking for a bit of a head start. The second video that I've made is 15 extra tips and this particular guide is going to be more suited to players who are a little bit more advanced, you know they've been playing the game for a couple of weeks and they're just looking for a couple of extra nits and bits to try and make their lives a little more easier, maybe do things a little bit more efficiently etc etc. If you don't find what you're looking for in the video that you're watching right now I will make sure to link the second more advanced video down in the description and I will also make sure that it is put up on screen at the end of this video as well. In total we have 30 hints altogether, and so some of you guys are going to have figured out a couple of these pointers already but try to remember that some of these tips will definitely be of use to other players so try to keep that in mind. As always my main aim is to try and present all of this info in as swift a manner as I possibly can so without further ado let's get started. Okay, some of the first things that you're going to be trying to figure out when you pick up this game for the first time is all about your dinosaur's info. You click on the first dinosaur that you've made and you're going to see all of its stats and what makes that specific dinosaur happy. You're going to see its water levels, how much grass it wants in its enclosure, what kind of novels it likes to read on a Saturday night after getting baked out of its mind. Some of the most important information that you want to be paying attention to here is all about the dinosaur's social and population needs. This is going to trip up the most amount of players early on in the game. One thing that you're going to pick up on very soon is that certain dinosaurs are annoying little bastards and require two or three friends to keep themselves happy as soon as they are created and if they don't get these friends then they lose their shit. In order to make things a little bit easier for you guys then I've compiled a quick list of the basic dinosaurs, the early dinosaurs that you can create that won't cause you any problems and don't need more than one dinosaur in order to keep themselves happy. Similarly on the flip side of that these are the dinosaurs that you kind of want to avoid in the early game. All of these little guys require friends or buddies and if they do not have them they will be problematic so be careful. So, once you become a bit more acquainted with your early game dinosaurs, it's a good idea to start building them early. You don't really need to wait around and start messing about with other more expensive buildings. Try and get a couple of the cheaper earlier game dinos out into the park because what this is going to do is start generating your income flow. Creating dinosaurs will raise your park rating, if only by a little bit, but this is still going to make guests start to appear in your park, your numbers are going to increase and then you're going to start making money per minute. Obviously the higher your rating, the more money that you're going to make, so it just makes sense to try and get your feet off the ground early. Once you've done this you're going to start to wonder with all your buildings available to you which ones should you prioritise building first. This could probably vary from player to player so it doesn't really matter too much but I'm going to give you the quick rundown of what I normally do when I play. So you've built your first herbivore dino enclosure, you've got your little cheapos in there. After this I would then go on to build either your ranger station or your ACU centre. These are arguably of equal importance, I don't think it matters too much as long as you kind of build them pretty close to one another. Your rangers are going to help you resupply food inside your dinosaur enclosures, they're also going to help you repair fences if there's any problems. Your ACU on the other hand is probably more important for when you know dinosaurs start to break out and start misbehaving. Your helicopter is what you're going to need in order to tranquilize your dinosaurs and knock them the fuck out if they've gotten out of their pen. In addition if you need to move your dinosaur from pen to pen or if you've got a corpse in your lawn and you need it tossed out into the ocean these are going to be used for that as well. After these two buildings you're going to want to start looking at your expedition and fossil buildings. You will use the expedition facility to send off your teams to dig for fossils all around the globe. Once your expedition teams come back they will then store the fossils in the fossil lab. After you've got a bunch of these buildings up and running you might start to find that you're needing extra power so I would then consider building extra power stations if you need them. Once you have your power flowing you can then go on to build other things that aren't really as important on the first starting island but you will need to learn to start building in the later islands and that is things like weather protection and guest shelters. Again, not super important to you guys just starting out in the game but it's good to kind of keep in mind this routine for later on. And then I would say that once you've got all of these basic buildings you can then start to worry about things like your guest attractions. So your food courts, your shops, your bowling alleys, your strip club. Um, again, you don't have to play the game in this particular order. This is just what I do and I would recommend this if you're just starting to learn the ropes and are looking for the most straightforward convenient path possible. 
Okay, so tip number four is pretty straightforward, but it can be overlooked if you haven't done this yet. If you are building a second power station and it is possible, try to keep your second power station that you're about to build close to the first one. The two main reasons that I do this is because that one, you're always going to know exactly where your power stations are if you keep them close together. This is going to make it really easy to continuously manage your power over and over. You know, if you need to look at all of your things together, you can snap to the one spot and you will be able to deal with all your stuff at once. But more importantly, it will also let your ranger team get to both power stations if they need to in the event of some sort of power outage or a sabotage routine or something like that. It's likely that a lot of you guys have already sussed this out already. It is pretty much common sense, but at the same time, if you're just starting out and you haven't thought about this yet, it can be a niche little strategy that will help prevent stress in the future and set yourself up for more success. On an extremely similar note then, it just makes sense to put this next tip with the previous one, and that is to build your ACU facilities very, very close to your carnivore pens. Again, this isn't a massive game changer, but if you can manage it, it just makes sense to do it. Obviously, if your herbivores get out and start harassing the public, it's not as big of a deal as if, for example, the T-Rex escapes. If there is some sort of drama llama breaking out in the middle of your park and you need to deal with it very fast, it is very, very handy to have your ACU unit very close to the big scaries in order to deal with them as fast as possible. If you put your velociraptors down the bottom of your island and your AC unit at the top of your island, you're gonna get stressed out, trust me. If you have enough space and can manage it, try to keep the guns next to the angry bastards. Moving on is probably one of the most important tips in this list and it's one that I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys will benefit from if you haven't already started doing it yourselves. That is of course to start sharing your fossils between your fossil centers on different islands. Let me explain what I mean. So once you've been on island one for a while, your numbers are starting to stabilize, you're earning a lot more money. What you can actually do is when you move over to your second island, that second fossil center that you inevitably will get around to building on island two shares the same fossils as the one on island number one. What this means is that if you're struggling with your finances on island two and you're just starting to find your feet again, you can dig up and store a bunch of fossils on your first island and then sell them all on your second island. I personally found that this helped speed up the kind of slower parts of the early game on the second and third and fourth islands and just helped kind of pad out some of the boring parts of the early game. It definitely cuts out a lot of waiting and if you can't be bothered waiting for organic money to come in from your guest sales then this is just a thing you can do. I'll leave it up to you guys to decide. Now that you've started a bunch of expeditions and found a couple of fossils you can start to look at the incubation and understanding how this whole process of creating the dinosaurs actually works. I guess this next pointer is then more of an explanation and a tutorial on how the system works, but it definitely helps to understand it properly in order to save yourself from getting pissed off. Every time that you extract DNA from a dinosaur fossil, you increase the percentage chance that that dinosaur has of being created in the Hammond lab when you're building your dinosaurs. Extracting the same fossil over and over again then means that you will eventually get your dinosaur percentage way, way up and you're going to have a lot less failures. Once you start modifying your dinosaur's genes and throwing in random fucking bits of like crab and antelope and all that shit, the percentage chance of success of them being created will decrease. The reason I'm going over all this is because in the early game when your funds are tight, sometimes you will find yourself throwing a bunch of your resources into creating a dinosaur and if the percentage chance of that viability is too low, you can end up losing that dinosaur after you've already paid the money for it. This can kind of tilt the fuck out of you if you do invest a lot of money into your dinosaurs that you're creating and then they fail. Keep an eye on this viability percentage number and you should be disappointed less often. A little bit later on then, you're going to find that you have enough funds to start utilising or building a fresh research centre and start upgrading shit. For me, the upgrades that I started looking at first of all were to do with the power station. Again, this is personal choice, but I found that being able to produce more power from the same station was a little bit more important than some of the other upgrades early on. You can save yourself a bit of money by upgrading the same power station rather than building a whole new fresh one. After this, I would consider upgrading the number of scheduled tasks that your ACU centre can perform in one sitting. You know, it's a lot more handy if you can schedule the helicopter to do two or three things at once, especially if there's an outbreak of dinosaurs and you've got like five or six dinosaurs in a pen, they all break out. Instead of just telling your helicopter to dart three and then go back to base, it just saves you a lot of hassle. The same can be said for your rangers and how many tasks they can perform as well then. If you are able to tell your rangers to refill three or four feeders as opposed to one or two, you can save yourself a lot of time. These are some of the upgrades that I would throw into buildings first. All right, this next tip is pretty chill. It's pretty easy going, but it's still very useful. Make sure that you're using your hotkeys because it's just going to save you so much time. It's going to save you so much clicking. You can use your M key to bring up your map and help you find dinosaurs that are hidden in some of your pens. You can use T to quickly bring up your transport helicopter and also your ACU unit 
unit the R key is going to let you then select your Rangers and then if you press your C key you can access your contract screen instantly. I'm pretty sure that you're actually shown a bunch of these things in the earlier stages of the tutorial but if you missed them hopefully now you're a bit more aware. You can also hold down your middle mouse button or mouse wheel, click it in and you can actually pan the camera. This might help a couple of people as well, I'm not sure. At the end of the day with the amount of fapping that you're going to be doing over how sexy your new Brachiosaurus looks, you're going to be developing some insane carpal tunnel problems between that and the amount of clicking you're doing between all of these stations. Do yourselves the favour and get in the habit of using these, trust me it will make your life so much easier. In addition to the last tip then, there is also this extra menu that I'm going to show you and it will also help you save a bit of time. So as you guys know, whenever a dinosaur dies, whenever a feeder needs replenished, whenever a fence is broken etc etc, up the top of your screen you will get this red flashing icon notifying you of the problem. However, often clicking on these icons don't take you directly to the problem which I think would have been a really cool feature. Instead what you have to do is if you click on the icon and then go over to the left hand side of the screen, click this menu, it will actually bring up a list of all the red icons in more detail. From here you can then click on the specific problem that's giving you the grief and it will take you directly to the thing as we were just talking about a second ago. Once you are then at the scene of the crime you can use the hotkeys that we just discussed in order to quickly select the faculty that you need and fix the problem in a really really quick way. In my opinion this definitely beats hitting the map key, trying to find the problem and then going back to the station that you need, clicking through all the stuff and then trying to fix it. This 11th tip that I'm about to talk about nearly didn't make it into my list so if you don't find this particular point useful then I won't blame you. In the early game when funds are really really tight you can actually use your rangers to take pictures of dinosaurs and although this doesn't give you a lot of money to begin with the funds can add up slowly over time if you get in the habit of doing this frequently. If you catch a couple of dinosaurs in the one shot, maybe a dinosaur eating a goat or breaking into a fence, a dinosaur orgy, whatever it is, you will find that the rewards are a little bit better than you would expect and you can actually generate a decent amount of money doing this. Again, not going to be at all useful for any of you late game park builders where you're making like hundreds of thousands of dollars a minute, but in the beginning when you're saving up for your first little dinos, this is ultimately going to help you earn a tiny bit of money and also give you a bit of a break from all the ball busting you're doing running around the park. Okay then, so for tip number 12, I would recommend that you guys try and listen out sometimes for the in-game sound cues that you get. Often around the park when something ominous is about to happen and shit's about to go down, you'll get this small sound clip from the game as a kind of mini warning that things are about to go wrong. This type of game for me is like a chill game that I like to play while listening to music or watching a film or something like that in the background, so I understand if a lot of you guys don't have your sound turned right up for this kind of shit, but if you are paying enough attention, the next time you hear the music change mid-track, it's probably worth a quick flick around your dino pens and try and catch some of the problems before they get too out of hand. <laughs> More often than not, if you hear a funny sound effect, it's likely that there's some antsy bastard in some corner of your park about to get up to some mischief. Just make sure that you catch that stegosaurus before it pole vaults over the 40 foot high concrete wall that you've built. Right, so let's talk about missions and contracts because that's going to be the next two points that we discuss in this guide. Missions are probably going to be the most important thing to pay attention to as they give you the most amount of money. These are the fixed set objectives that the game's going to make you do and that all players are going to experience when they play through the campaign. After you've done a few contracts for the same officer or department, you'll unlock a mission tailored to that specific department. The tasks that they normally have you doing normally align with your own goals anyway, so keep an eye on these and work towards them over time. On this topic then, in and around the contract mission area, it's a good idea to try and keep a balance of the officers and the tasks that you're doing for each of them. It's a smart idea to try and keep everyone happy doing this. Sometimes when you focus on one department specifically, you're going to knock all the other ones down too low. One thing I will say though on the flip side of this is that if you're close to a particular reward for one of the faculties, it makes more sense to just continuously keep doing the same contracts for the same faculty over and over in order to hit this. For me personally, I found that I would try and get to the end of each reward tree and then ditch that guy completely and then start focusing on the next one. If you get everything over and done with together then it means that you can just focus on one at a time and not be distracted by any of the other shit that's going on. Looking at contracts specifically then, these are the smaller little tasks that appear every now and then and a lot more frequently than the missions do. The most important thing around these is to make sure that you're constantly asking for contracts when you have finished the last one. This is especially prevalent in the early game as these can be some of the only ways that you can make money when you don't have that many dinos in your park. As with the missions, sometimes you will naturally complete contract tasks while starting to do some of the early things that 
that you're going to be doing anyway. I will also point out that it can be particularly tragic when you complete a certain objective and then two seconds later you get given a contract to redo the exact same thing you've just finished. You can hold three contracts at a time on top of the missions that you're offered so make sure that you're constantly replenishing these. You can have your contracts sitting idle doing nothing and then work towards them slowly as you play through. And last but not least you guys will be thrilled to know that I'm going to give you a very quick rundown on how the godforsaken terrain tool works. Honestly this feature is fine, it does exactly what it's meant to do but it's not that intuitive to use the first time you pick it up. The flatten terrain button is the feature that you're going to be using the most in order to create the pins and bits and bobs that you want to do. If you're trying to flatten out a surface to put a building on for example, you're going to want to click on the level that you want and then start dragging out in circles. If you are too close to a mountain it's not going to work, if you are too close to a building it's not going to work either. The smooth terrain button is really only there to make things seem a bit more natural after you've finished flattening your terrain and then building whatever it is that you want on top of it. If you try and use the smooth terrain button to try and flatten a bit of ground to build something on it's not going to work properly. As a general rule of thumb I wouldn't normally touch the terrain tool in the early game when you don't have a lot of money. Unfortunately as of just now there is no undo button so I guess what you could do is if you wanted to be really safe is bash in a quick save file before you start playing about with any of this stuff. This way if you accidentally create an irreversible dick shaped Mount Olympus then you don't have to panic. At the end of the day you will eventually get the hang of this tool, it's actually pretty straightforward once you do it a couple of times. Hopefully now you are a little bit more informed so if you do play about with it now you'll have a bit more luck than you would have done beforehand. And that pretty much rounds up this video folks. If you guys are interested in learning more about this game then I recommend that you jump over to my second video that has an extra 15 more detailed kind of tips and tricks. As always I'm constantly trying to improve my own gameplay so if you guys have noticed or thought up your own tips and tricks that I never mentioned in this video and don't appear in the second one then definitely feel free to fire them down in the comments. Let me know, let everyone else know because I guarantee that someone else will appreciate whatever it is that you've got to share. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hugely appreciate the support and I love you guys to bits. Thanks for watching guys. Peace out.